Hi there. Welcome to the Praying Christian Women podcast. This is Alana. I am here with my co-host, Jamie. And today we're going to be talking about what to do when you feel like you don't have the time to pray. We totally recognize that our listeners are busy Christian women, and we want to share some practical tips that might help you to find out that there really is more time than maybe you think there is to focus on prayer. So before we start in that, let's jump into a word of prayer. God, we just thank you so much for being able to come together today and just talk about productivity and being able to find time to incorporate you into our busy lives. Um, We just pray that you would speak directly to us, that you would just be um, the, the source of the passion and the desire and just the, um, the need to go to you in prayer, that it wouldn't be something that we have to do, but it would be something that we just desire to do with everything that is in us. In Jesus' name, amen. And along those lines, I wanted to start us out with a verse of the day, and it comes from um, Psalm, hang on, Psalm 42. And a lot of you may have heard this. It's, as the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go and meet with God? And I just feel like that's kind of at the heart of all of this, all of these discussions on finding time to pray or fitting prayer into our schedules is the root and the heart of the issue is having that desire in our hearts and and having that question in our mind, just when can I go and meet with God, like wanting to meet with God. And if you're here, that is your desire. We know that if you're looking for ways to pray more, that that is at the heart of your desires and God is going to answer that. So we hope that today we'll be able to jump into this question with some tips and just perspective shifts that might help you be able to accomplish that. Awesome. Well, thank you. And our just for fun that we're going to start out with is, are you usually early, late, or right on time? I hate to say it, but I'm <laughs> are you always late, late <laughs> perpetually late. I, if I could put a coin in a jar every time I said to my kids, we're late or we're late as usual. I mean, mm-hmm. I just wonder what kind of, and I've, I've really been convicted of it, not, you know, just, just wanting to move out of that because there, there are lots of issues at, at the heart of this chronically late thing, but I, I don't want that to be my children's identity. And I feel like I've kind of like made that our identity because uh-huh. we're always late. And I almost wonder if just saying it makes it more so and if I I, see that yeah yeah, if you're kind of always affirming yes we are the family that's always perpetually late we're the late people yeah Yeah. so I don't there's a self-fulfilling prophecy right there it is so you know maybe in six months we'll revisit this and we can ask (laughs) that question again and I can say I am always early or right on time Uh (laughs) how about you well I used to be you know like five minutes early you know just show up but then when I became a mom I quit and it had less to do with, okay, I'm a mom. I'm busy. It takes a while for the kids to get ready. I mean, that's part of it, but I hate showing up early when I have kids because then you're just waiting. I can totally relate to that. And and sometimes like, I don't know how it is in the lower 48, but Alaskans run on Alaskan time. And so if you invite someone over for dinner at five o'clock and they show up at 450, like that is that freaks you out because you you're expecting ten more minutes to get ready, you know, <laughs> and yeah. so I'm kind of cognizant of that too. So I went from being the person who always was at least a couple minutes early to now, like my goal is to always be right on time. That's good though. That's a good goal, and yeah, and I but I totally can relate to. I can't say though. I I almost wanted to say well before kids I was better, but I don't think no. I was. <laughs> I really don't. And, and it's just bad habit and planning. And it's really interesting because you and I took a personality test. You forwarded me that personality test thing. And one of the things that they asked was, are you perpetually late or are you early? Are you just on time? And it just made me realize that it is a procrastination personality Mm -hmm. kind of, or not even procrastination. I think it's a Maybe I a time just management. a time management issue uh-huh. 
And I am firmly in, in belief that I can change that. And so I'm excited to Amen. move forward out of that. <laughs> so we'll see. Well, you know, and that's funny because, for, so for those of you listening, if you're familiar, we're talking about the Meyer Briggs personality profile and it gives you four letters. And so what you're talking about, Jamie, is the last letter, which is the only one where you and I are different because I'm the J and you're the P. So I'm the one who has it all planned out and you're the one who's kind of the spontaneous. Oh, I'm I'm the pants. Yeah. So like that, that right there is like the biggest difference between you and me. Otherwise we're pretty similar. That is funny. Yeah. Yeah. But it makes us work well together. I think because I am also, I like taking direction and and you're definitely the organizing, you know, Mm -hmm. driving force of planning and vision and organizing when we work. Yeah. It's been really fun seeing how we work together, you know, on the podcast and stuff. So, um, but yeah, let's, let's jump into that. Because I feel like you and I have talked a lot about time management stuff. And now we get to actually talk about it on the podcast, which I'm super excited about. So we kind of have been throwing around this term, you and I have, I mean, about like prayerful productivity, which is what we wanted to start by telling you listening about. So I feel like we do this almost all the time. Let's start with the definition. That's, that's like become our thing. <laughs> so let's start with the definition of what is prayerful productivity. Yeah, and I think it, I, I picture prayerful productivity as inviting God into your schedule, just inviting him into so one simple. more, yeah. like tearing down the barrier between, okay, my plans are one thing and my spiritual life is another thing. And I just feel like yeah. tearing that wall down, inviting God into our plans and our work life or our whatever, whether your work is staying at home or whether it's Mm -hmm. going to work every day. Yeah. You explained that so well. So maybe that is why we always start with me having you define something because you do it so succinctly. (laughs) That is so funny because succinct is like the opposite of (laughs) how I would describe myself. So God, glory to God for that. Amen. No, I love how you put that. Just inviting God to be in your schedule, not having a distinction between what is your spiritual life and what is your just your day-to-day to-dos. So we're going to be talking a lot about to-do lists or even if you don't, write them down in a list, just the things that you've got to do. Because I know there were times in my life where I liked the idea of having absolutely nothing to do, literally, besides praying and reading the Bible. Like I went through seasons, like especially in college, like late teens, where I was like, I would love to live like a monk and do nothing but pray and read the word. But I was in college, I had classes to go to, I was involved in the school newspaper, like whatever you're, wherever you are in life, there's something that you need to be doing. And I used to think of it as, I'm so sorry, God, because I know that you want me to be spending 100% of my waking time just praying and reading my Bible. But really, like there are some things that I just have to do. <laughs> and now I don't see it like that at all. You know, I think about, is it Colossians where it talks about whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God, right? Yes. Yeah. And I think that shows a progression in understanding too, because I, I have gone through that same thing where I would feel guilty. I wouldn't feel guilty studying for an exam. I knew I had to do that. But, you know, I would feel guilty doing things in just for leisure. And, Extracurriculars too. And, or things, and I yeah. don't, yeah, I would think, oh, I could do this or I could be praying. Not right. to say that prayer should take a back seat to everything or that it should take a back seat to anything. But when you can incorporate it into your life, it may, then there's room for those other things too. Oh, for sure. Prioritize it. My husband and I were involved in youth ministry for over a decade and we would hear teens who really wanted to grow in their walk with God. And I loved that. And it was so exciting, but they would feel guilty about like they, they did feel guilty about studying or especially, you know, extracurriculars. It was kind of, I'm a Christian, but I actually love running. And I know that it's not God's best, but I just, I love to do it. So I'm hoping that he'll be okay with that. Instead of, you know, what we talked about with them is like, run for the glory of God. <laughs> mm-hmm. You know, like the story of Eric Little, the, the Olympian, right? Isn't that his name? I don't uh, know. The <laughs> chariots sounds- of fire guy. Oh, yeah. I don't know I his name, but his yeah. Name. 
but yeah, like he had this tension of, I love to run, but I kind of feel like I should be a, a missionary or a pastor, but man, I love to run. And he just realized, okay, God created me to be a runner. So I'm going to be the best darn runner I can be and do that for God's glory. And, and I think so, that, yeah, go okay. ahead. Well, I was going to say, and that just brings up a really good point because with prayerful productivity, you know, you can go on opposite extremes. You can totally leave God out of your productive mm -hmm. life, but you could also go into the extreme of almost superstitiously praying only for the benefits that that prayer will get your productive life. Yeah. I, and, mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, I just think before we talk about product, prayerful productivity, we're not talking about either extreme. We're talking yeah. about you know, like the, as the deer pants for streams of water. And when can I go meet with God? Longing for God to be part of your work life for his glory, like, like that runner did, you know, and yeah. not wanting to be glorified by asking for God's favor. Yeah. No, I totally went through all the extremes when I started writing novels. I went from, the, I know that I can't write a single word apart from God. So I'm going to, you know, to pray to the point of being somewhat superstitious. Like some of it was just discipline, but some really was superstition. Like I am not going to write before I have this time of prayer. But then I also went through stages where I was not praying nearly as thoroughly as I should have been. And my explanation was, okay, well, I'm I'm in a season now where God wants me to write novels. And so I'm serving God by writing novels instead of, you know, how we talked about on a previous episode, realizing that prayer is the real work. Everything else we do like flows out of prayer. And um, yeah. And I also went to the extreme where like 95% of the time I spent praying was praying about my novels, <laughs> you know? So I, I really feel like I made a bunch of, these mistakes that we're talking about. And, um, you know, it, it is, it's all about balance and mm -hmm. remembering that what we're doing, whether it's prayer or something else is for God's glory and not for the benefits that it gets us. Yeah. Well, and for those who have not heard the Martin Luther quote, Oh yeah. <laughs> so, you know, give a little background. This was, you're the one that brought this quote to my attention. So why don't you explain it and kind of the background behind it? Well, I forget where we even saw the quote for the first time, but Jamie and I both saw this quote by Martin Luther, um, the monk, not the civil rights activist. And he says, I have so much to do that I shall spend the first three hours in prayer. Like basically, I'm so busy today that I know I'm not going to be able to accomplish any of it unless I spend at least three hours praying. And I think we both read this and kind of chuckled to ourselves, right? We're like, okay. Yeah. That's not realistic for the 21st century if you're not a right. monk like you were. <laughs> yeah. But I remember, so it used to be that Sunday nights were my nights to get like everything totally ready for the week. It was my night. I, I take the weekends off. Sunday night was when I would get back into work mode and just jump into my to-do list, get a bunch of the little things like emails and stuff taken care of so that by Monday morning, I was a hundred percent ready to just start writing again. And there was one Sunday night, <clears throat> this was um, a couple of years ago, even I think. And I had so much on my to-do list. It was absolutely overwhelming. And I do write down my to-do list and I just felt so overwhelmed. And Jamie and I had just come across this quote and shared a chuckle about it. But for some reason it really stood out in my mind. And at that point, my husband was doing youth group by himself, and I was home with our children. And so I, I had this two-hour window every Sunday night where he was at youth group that I would spend on this busy work. And like I said, I was so overwhelmed that I knew that if I turned on my computer and had my to-do list in front of me, I would spend like an hour and 50 minutes of that two hours just like on Facebook or something feeling overwhelmed. And so... I decided to give Martin Luther's, um, what would you call it? His, his gimmick. No, his, <laughs> his, <laughs> his mantra. mantra. Yeah. I, you know, just this quote that he had, like, I'm so busy. I know I can't accomplish everything unless I spend three hours in prayer. So I'm like, okay, God, I don't have three hours, but I actually do have two hours and just for kicks, 
let's see what happens. And so I started by taking that to-do list and pacing the hallways. I'm a huge pacer. You can ask my husband. It kind of makes him nervous. <laughs> but uh, I was pacing the hall and just praying over each of these things on my to-do list. And it was amazing what happened because I probably had like no joke, 12 different categories. And each of those categories had anywhere from like six to 10 things I had to do to get them done. So for two or three of them, I realized, okay, these don't need to be done this week. They don't even need to be done this month. Like I can put these on the back burner. And then there were two other things where I realized pretty quickly, oh, yeah, this does need to be done. But hey, I have a super computer savvy son who I could pay in computer game time to do these things for me. And he could do it a lot quicker than I could, and he would enjoy it more than I would. And then, so, you know, that left me with like half of the things I thought I had to do. And then at that point, I continued to pray and really was able to just kind of, and this was totally the Holy Spirit was able to prioritize like, okay, I'm going to do this first and then I'll do this and then I'll do that. So that by the end of this two hours, I seriously felt like I had a manageable plan going into the week. And it was amazing because I wasn't even expecting it to work. I was just kind of like, I literally was like throwing up my hands being like, I don't even know where to start. So I'm just not going to start. Yeah. Better to pray than just procrastinate. So yeah. procrastinate. Pray, cast, pray, procrastinate. Pray, <laughs> but no, it was just amazing the kind of clarity that the Lord brought me when I just brought my to-do list for him. And I think like from that moment on, like that changed Sunday nights for me. Like it's a Monday when we're recording this. Last night, it was <laughs> very much like, you know, I don't necessarily take every single thing on my to-do list and just spend two hours praying for it. But Monday, instead of becoming my, like, get as far ahead as I can so I don't have to worry about busy work at night, like, Monday really has become my pray and reflect over the week so that I'm going into it with a plan night. And it's been a huge difference. That's really good. Well, and I had a similar thing happen this weekend. I had just kind of a crazy day with my daughter's birthday party was Saturday and we had hockey, three kids had hockey and my husband's out of town. And so I was pretty stressed out um, at the beginning of the day about how everything was going to work out. And, and my son, actually my oldest son just kind of said, as we were getting ready to go out of the house, he said, mom, please don't be stressed out. And I thought, Aww. okay, I am. I'm, I'm stressing everybody out. I'm being stressed out. I'm not bringing glory to God. And so I just thought, okay. And I, I had been short with the kids. I had been just whisking around the house, you know, just like a drill sergeant. And so I just stopped and I apologized to the kids and I prayed out loud that God would order my thoughts, that he would work things out. And it sounds kind of silly, but one of my biggest concerns was the physical cake. I had worked hard on this cake because she wanted a unicorn cake and I made a unicorn cake and it turned out pretty nice. And I was afraid that it was not going to make it because it had to make it through hockey practice and I was going to have to leave it in the car. And I was afraid it wasn't very stable as it was and just transporting it from one place to the other. And it just, um, the, to make a long story short, the place that we were having the party in, I did not think I that they were going to let me in early to be able to bring the stuff, but they did. And so I was oh, nice. able to like cut a whole leg of, you know, it didn't have to stay in the car. I could drop it off before hockey and, you know, it just, God was very gracious. And, and through that, actually through that prayer, um, like my son was kind of, prompted to pray specifically about the cake. He was the one holding it. And I think he was afraid Aww. that he was going to be responsible for its demise. Right. <laughs> and so he said, let's pray about the cake, that the cake would make it. And like, I ended up calling the place right after that to see if they would allow me, if they were going to be open, if they were going to let me drop it off sooner. And so all of this to say that just committing those plans, I went into the day just literally not knowing how we were going to get everywhere that we needed to be. Mm -hmm. And God answered that prayer. And not only that, he let my kids see it. And that's and cool. He worked through my kind of mom fail of being too anxious. And it was just very neat how he's a redeemer. He's a redeemer of time. He's a redeemer of mistakes. And it's just, it's never too late in your plans to commit them to him. Even if you've jumped in and you've failed, you know, just give it to him right in the midst of it. As soon as it comes yeah. to your mind, 
Yeah. I love how you put that, the redeemer of time. Um, Scott and I, my husband, have this story where we truly believe that God just created time out of nowhere. Did I ever tell you our airplane story? Yes, I remember this yeah. story. That was so, cool. It was when we were engaged, I was living in Vermont. He was living in LA. It was two months before the wedding. And I was, he flew out to Vermont to meet the people that I'd been working with at this girl's home. And then we were flying back to California where I was going to live with a couple from his church until we got married. And we had a layover in Nashville and we had some really close family friends who had followed both Scott and me through a lot of drama and they wanted to meet us at the airport for dinner. And our flight getting to Nashville was maybe like half an hour late. And so it was going to be a sort of a tight squeeze. And we were a little bit debating, like, should we, shouldn't we? Um, this was before, like, everybody had cell phones. And so it, there wouldn't have been an easy way to get in touch with them. So we just said, okay, you know what? This couple has been amazing to us. We're just going to go ahead, meet them for dinner, leave the results up to God. You know, like it, it sounds a little silly right now to put it this way, but we kind of made it an act of faith. Like we're going to trust that God's going to make it work out okay, you know, if we go and have dinner with this couple. So we went and had dinner, had a great time, didn't feel rushed, which in, in itself was kind of an answer to prayer and made our way back and realized, well, our flight had been delayed by almost an hour. So there was no rush at all. So that was kind of the first cool thing. It's like, oh, that's neat. All right, so the flight was delayed almost an entire hour. We got on the plane. Most of the time, the captain will say something like, you know, sorry guys about the delay. We'll try to make it up. We're expecting to be at LAX at whatever. You know, like some kind of update like that. Nobody said a single thing about the flight being delayed. And we got to LAX, like at the time we were originally planning to. Wow. And so... You know, like we got off the plane and we were just kind of like, what just happened? Like, did God just sort of invent an hour? <laughs> and no in a way else like, noticed but us. <laughs> I know. Awesome. But when you think about it, like he can, I, I think sometimes about time in the same way that you can think about tithing, you know, how people will say, you know, if you don't feel like you have enough money to tithe, then that's like exactly when you should be tithing. Like, you know, how God can create money out of nowhere, which he has totally done for us when we're faithful with tithing. But I feel like he does that with time too. Like if you feel short on time and give the first fruits of your time to God, whether that's through prayer or maybe a certain kind of service that you feel like he wants you to get involved in, but you don't have time for, like, I truly feel like he can create time out of nowhere for you. I do. And I've experienced that too. Um, when I, I had a really busy window of time when I was transitioning from working at a daycare to working as our uh, at our church in Arizona as the mm -hmm. children's ministry coordinator and I overlapped those two jobs plus at the same time I was working for my dad part time oh, doing wow. paperwork at night and so I was um the mornings um were kind of overwhelming when I thought about all I had to do but it was so funny because I, in the mornings I did have, I called in messages for my dad. I would call in the voicemail and I would write down the messages and then get them to the people that needed to get the messages for that day. And that was before I went into work for the daycare and while I was trying to kind of incorporate work for the church as well. So mm -hmm. the mornings that I woke up and committed to pray and, and just do like even just five minutes of Bible study, I noticed those mornings almost always the, there were hardly any if no messages to call in and I had more time and I got to I, I left with plenty of time and I do feel like it I, I felt like God I didn't get up any earlier and there were some times that I actually got up a little bit late and and if I did say okay I'm gonna pray I felt like I had extra time and yeah that's not to say that you shouldn't plan because I know that yes God is gonna bless our planning I cannot procrastinate and expect God to make up for my poor planning necessarily um, but sometimes he has and and I can attest right. that it, sometimes <laughs> he really has when I've given it over to him and so I don't know it's just um, I believe that also, whether it's a well, and, time or whether it's actually he stretches the time or yeah. makes us more productive. It always, or all of the above, <laughs> all of the above. 
Well, and don't you feel like busyness is just sort of a, a state of mind anyway? Like, are you the one who said that lately? Yes. And I think Ann Voskamp said it in one of her books. I don't know, or blogs or something. I just remember her saying, busyness is a mindset. And I've right. been very convicted of the fact that I've had this like busy mom identity syndrome where mm -hmm. I have just, it's almost like I have a badge of honor, my identity made it a badge of honor. Oh yeah. I'm a busy, I'm a busy mom. My kids do all these things and I'm trying to do this and that. And, um, it's almost a badge of honor, but I feel like it's, you're shooting yourself in the foot because I have had to make a point of being in the moment because even when I'm not physically busy, my brain is going and thinking forward to all the other stuff mm -hmm. that has to get done. And so I have this perception of always being busy. Whereas I, the other day at the grocery store, I was just walking through the store and I just, in my mind was like, God, thank you for this quiet time to walk through the grocery store. I'm not busy right now. I mean, I even had to just kind of tell myself that. Right. And it was restful. And like this morning in the shower, I was just like, thank you, God. I'm not busy right now. I am relaxing. Yeah. I might as well be at a spa, you know, uh, I am having a moment of quiet and peace. And I prayed and I just, I'm trying to do that more. And I am finding that I am not feeling as stressed and I'm not having that perception of being a busy person like I did before. And yeah, so that's, that's been helpful. That's really, really neat. Yeah. Yeah. Because I think sometimes busyness can even become an idol, you know, like the things that you are busy with or even just your identity as a busy person because it makes you feel important, you know, like look at all that she's involved with kind of feel. Yeah. And then feeling also like if I don't do these certain things, nobody else will. I think there's an element of pride involved in that also thinking that somehow if I don't say yes to this, this or that, um, you know, I think part of prayerful productivity is inviting God into what you say no to. And, you know, the oh, old sure. adage, you know, God's best versus lots of good things. I mean, there's so yeah. many good things, but what is God's best? And, you know, I like last year, God's best, I was asked to do vacation Bible school and I really strongly felt, and it was hard for me to say no, but I really felt God saying no. This year, I felt God saying yes. And I, I just think that we need to remove the guilt factor from saying no because God will provide someone else. And I think to think that he won't is prideful and, you know, and, and I've, I've been there and I continue to be there. So I just really, I'm, I'm a work in progress here. Yeah. yeah, no, that's such a good, a good word, you know, and praying over those kinds of decisions, you know, God, do you want me to do VBS this year? Instead of just saying, well, if, if I don't do it, it's not going to get done. And <laughs> right. Or being yeah. guilted or wanting to be true guilt is relied upon the person that's the go-to person and always, you right. know, not wanting people to think poorly of you. Yeah. Well, and sometimes things just need to get done, you know, so mm -hmm. it is, it's hard to discern, which is mm -hmm. why I think it is important to be prayerful about these things. Yeah. So let's jump into some just practical tips for people like most of us who are really busy. Just what are some ways that even in spite of our busyness, that we can still be making prayer a priority and to just bring this concept of prayerful productivity into our lives? Well, I think kind of like the like the time out idea of taking time out when you're feeling mm -hmm. overwhelmed um, yeah. and even recognizing your time out that you didn't recognize before by quieting your mind, you know, so either, mm -hmm. you know, so I don't know for me, sometimes it means I like, I don't know about you, but sometimes when my kids get a little bit sick. And they're not like suffering sick. <laughs> it's almost nice. It's you, almost nice because you have an I excuse to slow down and not go places and not yeah. do things that you normally have to do. Um, if they're suffering, I don't like that. But yeah. if no, just, I totally get it. If it's just know, a tiny fever, bit. Yeah. And they just kind of, you know, yeah, you can't go anywhere with a fever. That wouldn't be right. It's almost a relief. So oh, why not create timeout without having a fever to to 
fall back on yes. and just say, you know what, this week or just this day, our family is going to rest. We need it. And so nothing is going to happen and we're going to be okay with that. I, I think that might yeah. be a good thing to do. Well, and so many people have moved away from the idea of a Sabbath. Yeah. Where in my mind, you know, like we still take all the other nine of the Ten Commandments very seriously, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, um, I found with health, so this was back in like high school, college, I found that I would get, I was super high achiever and I would work myself sick. And what I found was basically God was going to make me take a time out one way or the other. If I voluntarily (laughs) took time out once a week to rest and relax, I wouldn't get sick. If I did not and kept going and going and going, eventually I would crash and have to take that time out, Mm -hmm. you know? So, um, you know, in the old Testament, the story where they were supposed to, not the story, but you know how they were supposed to let the land lie fallow for, you know, one year about every seven. Yeah. And they didn't, and they didn't, and didn't. And that was part of the exile, right? So that the land would get that period of rest. Mm-hmm. You know, so I feel like God's going to make you rest. So you may as well do it voluntarily. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, he just, he modeled rest for us. He did. Yeah. And, and, and it's a universal law. I mean, it's, it's an agricultural law that if you deplete mm-hmm. mineral supplies, you know, and so it's the same with our bodies. If you deplete that energy and you don't, and one thing that um, a good friend, our pastor's wife from our last church talked about when I was doing children's ministry was your Sabbath isn't Sunday. You know, my Sabbath was not Sunday because I Especially was working. Especially if you're involved in ministry, yeah. Yeah. And so she said, you need to be really conscious of taking a real Sabbath because your Sabbath is not Sunday. That, that doesn't count. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, good word. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, you know, we also should point out that we shouldn't get legalistic about this. No. And then that, plenty of examples. that's work. <laughs> yeah. And we have plenty of examples in scripture where Jesus did good things on the Sabbath. Like mm-hmm. we went to a church once where a pastor back decades earlier had been fired for visiting a congregant on a Sunday to pray with them. Like, you know, in my mind, that's way over the top. That is not the heart of what a Sabbath is for. <laughs> no. And there could be things that seem like work that are restful to you. Oh, you yeah. Know, that are sure. relaxing and that are just bless your heart, you know, yeah. and there could be seasons where God calls you to do things that are hard or do work or things that he, he gives you rest in that. But yeah. Well, here's a perfect example. Before Scott and I got married, when I worked at the girl's home, we had a day off a week and I would spend that time writing. And now it's the exact opposite. Now I write my five days a week and I am sure to take the weekends off because, you know, back then writing was like what I did for pleasure and leisure Mm -hmm. and relaxation. Now writing, it's still enjoyable, but it is also work. And so I, you know, I know I have to take that time off. That is a really good, that's a good example. So, you know, kind of along that line, I want to throw in another tip, which for some people is going to sound counterintuitive, but I feel like to enjoy in general, the healthiest prayer life possible is to make sure you're getting enough sleep because Sleep impacts so many, um, like I, I've never heard a sermon <laughs> preached on the importance of getting sleep, <laughs> but I've definitely read, like read the books and the research papers that talk about it. And, you know, prayer does involve a lot of mental energy and it's super clear that you're most mentally alert when you're getting the most sleep. So for those of you who are super busy and want to make more time to pray and might feel like waking up half an hour or an hour earlier is the only way to do it. Sure, it might it might be, and it might work perfectly for you, and it might be what God is calling you to. But I would just suggest that that wouldn't be the very first thing you try necessarily, or that if you do try it and it doesn't seem to work, that you don't beat yourself up because sleep is super important just for our brain's health, and a brain that functions well is a brain that's going to be able to stay focused better when we pray. Yeah, definitely. I think um, another another kind of way that you can incorporate um, prayer into the busyness is to stop making busyness your excuse. And I think you had a story about that, didn't you? Yeah. Yeah. You know, this whole concept of, I don't have time for that. How in almost every single time we say, I don't have time for that. Like we're actually lying. (laughs) 
<laughs> because you know there's there's always going to be time for what is the most important like if <laughs> this is probably like too much information for most listeners but i've gotten to where like when i need to use the bathroom i just need to use the bathroom you know, like I have a shorter window than I used to of how long it's <laughs> going to take me to be able to wait. <laughs> yeah, total TMI. But truly, like I couldn't tell myself, oh yeah, I don't have time for that. Like I'm going to find time to use a bathroom. <laughs> mm -hmm. Or, you know, like there was a story um, that I read in a book on time management. It wasn't like a Christian prayer book, but it was just on time management. And the author was talking about how Okay, so let's picture there's the mom who's busy at work. She's a work at home mom. She's on her computer and her four-year-old comes in and says, mom, can you play with me? And mom says, no, dear, I don't have time. Okay, that's legit. Like I've done that to my kids. But imagine now that the girl comes in and she's screaming because she, you know, just cut her finger and she's gushing blood. The mom is not going to say, sorry, dear, I don't have time to help you right now. Like mom is going to shut down that computer and take care of what needs to be taken care of. And so it's not ever truly a matter of not having time. It really is just a matter of our perspective and our priorities. And so I would say that, you know, the takeaway for this is just to be careful with how you think and talk about time, you know, sort of like what we talked about with you, Jamie, saying like, oh, we're always late, mm -hmm. you know, like, no, you don't have to be, or I never have enough time. Well, actually you have as much time as the rest of us do. Like nobody has, unless, you know, you're like Scott and me on an airplane and God creates an hour out of nothing. In general, we all have 24 hours in our day. So I think, you know, it's, it's kind of, um, it's not a tangible thing you can do, <laughs> like setting your clock, you know, an hour early to wake up or something, but just being, cognizant of how you think about time, I feel can really help you understand, yeah, I actually do have the time. I just need to maybe shift things around a little bit. Yeah. And inviting God into that process of prioritizing, it's very helpful to, like you were doing, you know, where you sit down on Sunday nights and you have a list and make a list and then pray through it and, and number them based on how God prioritizes those things, you know, because mm -hmm. if you're not going into your schedule, like this is my issue because I am a fly by the seat of my pants kind of person, but I do like structure. And if I'm not going into my schedule with an idea of what my goals are and what the, what the top things are that are important mm -hmm. to accomplish, I will spend my entire day puttering and getting nothing yeah. measurable done. So inviting God into prioritizing those things and, and making that spiritual component into a um, organizational and, and, and practical list building, yeah. whatever. I don't know what no. you want to call that. No, I totally agree. And we already mentioned it once, but I feel like it's worth just talking about again, this idea of letting go of that busy mindset and mm -hmm. to realize, no, that's not a godly way to live, to always feel super anxious, super flustered, mm -hmm. super important. You know, like I can't take a day off because then the world's going to end. Well, you know what? <laughs> if you were sick in the hospital, the world would still keep going. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. like people would find a way to to adapt to life or you're resting. Mm -hmm. So yeah, just be careful with your health, with your sleep, with getting a Sabbath rest and all of these can help not only just your prayer life, but just your concept of time so that you're not one of these people who's just so on the move that you almost feel breathless after interacting with them, you know? Yeah. And one last thing too, um, that really came to my mind when you were talking about um, delegating to your son some uh -huh. of the tasks. You know, when Moses had all of this stuff to do, I think oh, it was yes. his father-in-law who mm -hmm. said, you can't do all this on your right. own. You need to delegate. And that might be a key is asking God, how can I delegate better? Because this is another thing that I struggle with is just feeling it's it's another pride issue i think like well i can do it better i can do yeah, it faster nobody's going to do it like i could right and so but but asking god inviting god into how can i delegate some of these things how can i be more efficient and work smarter and not harder at some of the things and get the same number of things done yeah. Oh, I love that. Yeah, that's super good advice. So we are really excited to tell you guys about a new course that we've just put out where we get into some of these issues a lot deeper. 
and more thoroughly. So this is a video course and each day is only going to take you maybe about 10 minutes to go through and it's got about 15 um, 15 modules, 12 modules, I forget exactly, not super long. Wow. Yeah, 12 modules. So, you know, you could take a weekend and go through the whole thing, kind of like a personal prayer retreat, or you could just do, you know, one a day, however you want to do it. But we have just videos and some PDFs and things like that, that are designed to really help you focus your time and attention on the Lord. And so this is the, um, <laughs> what's the official name? The prevailing the no, smash really your, prayer boot camp, right? Yeah, really prayer boot camp, and it's specifically smash your prayer blocks. Is yeah, the, because we all have all these prayer blocks, you know, like we were talking about, just the sense of feeling overwhelmingly busy, or you know, any of these things. So we are super excited to offer you guys these videos and PDFs and and this whole um, whole shebang. So you can find out more information or enroll at prayingchristianwomen.com slash blocks, as in your prayer blocks, which is what this course is talking about, the things that keep you, like busyness, from praying the way you should. And was there anything else, or should we, are we ready to jump into the blessing? Nope, I think we're blessing ready. All right, well, here's your blessing for the day. Today and all days, may you be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. May he clothe you in his robes of salvation and adorn you with garments of praise. May you put on today a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. May you be covered by the full armor of God so that whatever this day may bring, you will be able to hold your ground. And over all these virtues, may you put on love, which holds them all together in perfect unity. And our benediction is from Philippians 4.23. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen.